So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So welcome to the ACNS YNS uh, webinar. So uh, I'm Ben, and to, today on behalf of the uh, Professor Kato, so uh, so please uh, let me introduce our uh, chair discussion and speakers today. So uh, our chair today uh, is uh, Professor Quinlin, who is the uh, professor and chairman in the Department of Real Surgery, Second Affiliated Hospital at the Suchu uh, University of China. So along, uh, uh, alongside with us uh, would be uh, will be a uh, Professor uh, Sharon, who is uh, talking about the functional neuroscience uh, is the last frontier. And also we have our uh, wireless uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Seik, uh, who will talk about the interesting uh, cerebral vascular cases and also another expert uh, speakers, uh, Professor Ken, and uh, who is uh, talking about the anatomical consideration for virtual sigmoid uh, approach and its advanced methods. So also uh, Professor Takashi, uh, we'll talk about how I perform surgery of uh, cavernous sinus. So for the discussion uh, today, uh, we have uh, Professor Ash Ashley Kuma and also uh, Professor uh, Kasandi. So may I introduce uh, our chair, Professor uh, uh, Professor Quinan, to uh, to uh, introduce our first uh, speakers. Professor Lam, please. Uh -huh. The professor Kafu will have a will, will have a have a welcome welcome speech now. Yes, just you can introduce the first speaker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, good, uh, good morning, ladies and uh, gentlemen. It's my pleasure to chair today's SNS Young Neurosurgeons uh, webinar. Today there will be uh, both expert uh, speakers and uh, young neurosurgeon speaker. Two other professors will participate in the discuss. The content uh, includes functional neurosciences, case report, approach anatomy, and uh, cover the sinus surgical technique. I believe this meeting will bring great benefits to everyone. Uh, first of all, let's welcome Professor Yoko Kato, oh, the, president of, the president <laughs> of uh, the president of the president of SNS. Welcome to uh, yeah. welcome to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Kendan. So a uh, long time we'll see. I'm so happy to see your face. So the, today's uh, webinar is another very excellent the speakers. So we all are looking for the the uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. So uh, the, the first, uh, let's welcome Professor, Professor Sanen Srinivasan to have a uh, lecture. The topic is the functional neurosciences is the last frontiers. Welcome. Yes, uh, we can see the slide now. Kindly unmute your mic, Professor Sharon. Please unmute your mic. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Can yes. you hear me now? Yes. 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 Sorry. So, yes, yeah, so I'm talking about functional neurosciences, which is the future. So the world cannot afford disability. So we need to move from just saving lives through structure to actually, you know, uh, giving them better quality of life. So coming, all of us know about stroke, head injuries, brain infections, by brain, spinal cord tumors, brain tumors, Parkinson's, spinal cord problems, dementia, and the list is long for us as you know, neuroscientists, both neurologists and neurosurgeons. Now, what's happening to these people? Some of them are in coma. Some of them are, you know, having other problems. Some of them bedridden, wheelchair bound, walking balance issues, ADL issues, tremor, speech, swallowing, seeing, reading, writing. So many problems, understanding memory, mental speed, so many different circuits in the brain are going through all this process. Unfortunately, the MRI scans do not show up all these things. All these things are damages the functional brain and spinal cord circuits and the apps in the brain and the spinal cord. But the, July 22nd was the World Brain Day and the theme for 2023 was brain health and disability. We should leave no one behind. I think this is a very powerful statement and I think the basis of what we are going to talk today. 
And interestingly, 13 August was the Neuro Rehab Awareness Day. So with all of this, like how fish takes to water and orthopedic surgeons take to physiotherapy, we neurosurgeons haven't done the same with neuro rehab and functional neurosciences. You know, many of us, after an acute care, we say, my job is done. It's now somebody else has to take over this patient, look at it. Honestly speaking, it is our responsibility. But let's see how to push the frontiers in neuroscience, a clinician's perspective. And like all of, I tell everybody, I come from the Silicon Valley of India called Bengaluru, but we are the original IT industry, which is the human central nervous system. So let us look at how to restore functional independence in people with disabilities due to brain and spinal cord injuries, which is function, function, function. So in acute care management, especially in neurosciences, saving life seems paramount. What are the expectations of the patient and the family? Life plus quality of life, because otherwise it's impossible for them to survive. So structure, structure, structure. Is that what we keep talking about? The edema is less, the edema has disappeared, the clot has disappeared, the tumor is out, so on and so forth. What do the family wants? The family and the patient's expectations function, function, function. So this is a fundamental difference that we are struggling with to understand structure, structure to function, function, function. So in the world of functional neurosciences, this is the family's expectation. I think this is the same across the world when I was in Japan training, same question. Will my patient improve? Will he, she become normal again? How long will it take? What all do we need to do for that? And is there hope? Meaning is the patient rehabable? Some of them yes, some of them no. To do all this, we need to know all these things. What the reason for the situation of the patient? Was it a stroke, injury, brain infection, spinal cord, degenerative diseases? What's the current level of functioning of the patient? That we will not know by any MRI or CT scan. We don't know the level of functioning. What are the different disabilities the patient is having? What are the expectations of the family? Do we know whether what all the abilities the patient needs to have? How do you know if the patient is improving and progressing in the right direction? Can we measure progress? Brain function tests, as an example. How can all this be communicated to the patient family and can we issue reports? So the mental shift I had to make from being predominantly a structural neurosurgeon to a functional neurosurgeon was quite dramatic. It had a lasting impact and even the way I evaluated and treated all my patients, including emergency electives, even during surgery. So it's not about we operate and somebody else takes care of the function. We need to be responsible to make sure how many neurons, how many circuits that we are preserving so that the rehabilitation team gets the best result. The functional neuroscience is the magic of treating hardware and software together. The only organ in the body which has individual software is the central nervous system. And like the apps in the phone, we have apps in the brain. <clears throat> so let us look at the neurological disability that we are having in India. Neurological disability is likely to become the third epidemic. And according to one of our major institutions of uh, you know, neuroscience in India called NIMHANS in Bangalore, this is a 2010 data between traumatic brain injuries, age-related dementia, and stroke incidents. Just three, these three brain conditions, forget about all the other things, we are adding an impact of more than 35 lakh or 3.5 million people to the disabled pay population annually, which is as big as a tie to city. Every minute in India, seven new people will acquire a neurological disability, about 11,000 a day. And I'm quite sure 2022 statistics is much worse. And I'm quite sure all over the world, there's a variation of the same thing happening at the end of the day. Some, some places more, some places less in the way that's happening. And these people don't die, they don't survive. And if we add other patients who have functional disabilities during the course of treatment, you know, Parkinson's, focal hand dystonia, tremors, cerebral palsy, the list is very long, iatrogenic or otherwise, these numbers only big, get bigger and nastier. So how did we do it? So I want to tell you how we in, in our hospital and our you know, society back in Bangalore, how did we try to address this issue of functional disability and how can you get our patients better? So functional neuroscience, step one, is we came up with a concept called functional neurosciences. We moved from structure to thinking function. It doesn't matter what was the underlying etiopathology. And it is that we realized, I realized over time, it's a combination of neuromodulation with advanced neuro rehabilitation. So you have to work the both together seamlessly, one with the other, to get fantastic results. And that is under one roof, seamless delivered, end-to-end, -end, is the ideal situation for this to be in. So what did we do? Then I needed to transform our neurosciences company from a purely clinical company to a clinic tech and data sciences company. <clears throat> because technology is very important. And I think health science generally is lagging behind. 
but definitely in acute care we've got the best microscopes the you know navigation all of those things but definitely once the acute care is done tech has not come in as yet in a big way to help to reconnect the damaged brain circuits to rewire them and refire them and get the data in an organized way that we can then do machine learning and ai so i'm going to add a little bit of technology into this conversation as we talk through this process so we try to meticulously map brain functional brain circuits and that's step number 2 that we did so i try to map it in my own way you know look all so if you see the core the core is the goal is to perform any task eventually the patient wants to perform their task on a day to day moment basis moment to moment basis either is making a phone call using the washing machine using the microwave driving a car getting back to work playing a game whatever it is they need to perform the task with skill which is goal oriented environmentally appropriate energy efficient socially acceptable and with confidence this is all everybody expects for then you have the sensory motor system you got the visual system you got the you know the cognitive system and the you know communication system all of them having to work together in a very seamless way like a symphony to deliver this process so how did we deliver this cutting edge things we thought this we met standards evidence based replicable process based treatments this was a very important thing like how the acute care surgical steps have got standardized and evidence based rehabilitation or chronic care has not yet gone to that step at least in our country and i didn't i didn't find much of evidence even online for other things so that's what we did and then we went through a process and then what did we do then we went online we went digital we tried our best to keep costs down because in a place like india obviously you know the you know we had to automate to keep basic some repetition things down so then we put all this into customized software we have built a software called neurologix i'm going to show you that a little later on in the conversation it's a logic that we have used to make this whole thing happen that's a step number 3 and then what did we do did we put the whole thing together and we still transformed it you know which is a concept i call mass customization you have to mass customize treatment so that you know people don't have to keep on doing trial and error trial and error and come up with their own path if we can really help people to find the shortest and you know easiest path to get to their goal it's very easy so we innovate we transform and we disrupt the environment that's is digital transformation i'll let me show you some things i am like i tell everybody i am in the hardware business as a neurosurgeon all you neurosurgeons will agree with that a simple thing just to start this conversation you know it is a clot in the left side of the brain you know there's a hematoma there for, and then post surgery there's no hematoma that means we say operation successful but the question is patient condition is he going to wake up immediately not at all so we, i realized very early in my practice and training that physical healing is not necessarily equal to a good functional outcome the ideal goal is to restore restore back 100 level of functioning is that possible in every patient i don't think so so what like i said already in case an emergency is the same thing i'm going to skip this slide you know and uh, go next so sorry so we added iomt which is internet of medical things based personalized medicine healthcare into functional neuroscience i thought this is a very focused area and can we try this there's no life at stake there's only you know getting quality of life so the risk is not as much as in managing life related critical care situations can we actually adapt this here in a controlled environment and that's what we did and we're trying to do that here how does it work the integration of internet medical things with personalized medicine to transform the healthcare space especially in field of rehabilitation interconnected network of medical devices and applications the technology revolution of the rehabilitation is being approached and then by leveraging imt the healthcare providers can provide customers rehab even at home so there's a lot of big concept happening everywhere saying that it's less expensive to keep the patients at home and manage their services rather than keeping them inside a hospital which is too expensive and even in countries like america they are encouraging the insurance companies to literally push patients out of hospital earlier than later so if you look at this whole thing remote patient monitoring data driven decision making personalized treatment plans real time feedback and engagement and the timely interventions of preventive care these are these five points are very critical for us to be able to deliver this care at a very organized way and you may get the best out of it at lesser cost because in india and as in many other countries cost is a premium let us look at the first the world of neuro you know modulation all of us know what is vr ar mr robotics ai you know ml and i always tell people as doctors we come from the world called rr real reality our patients are real our their suffering is real our treatments are real the results are real good or bad 
So let's look at some of the misbehaving brain circuits. I want to introduce a concept which I learned in, uh, under Professor Takwa Mitara in Tokyo Women's Medical University in Japan way back in 2015. He's my guru you know, about leasing brain, uh, you know, for brain circuits. And I think it's a very cost-effective way. We've been doing it very well here. Leasing, I call it leasing version 3.0 because version 1.0 is the pre-series scan era, which is ventriculography. And then the, you know, this was the 1950s and then Sindopa came in and boom, you know, the surgeries came down drastically and it just went on. Sindopa was, you know, sine qua non with treatment of Parkinson's disease. Then what happened, the levodopa induced limitations and side effects kicked in. And then there's a revival of the stereotactic neurosurgery and enter version 2.0, which is CT early MRI era. This is my guru, Professor Takwa Mitara from Tokyo Women's Medical University. And then the version 3.0 is the post DBS era when we realize that they really not the solution for everything. There's still a lot of challenges patients cannot afford. Plus, they have its own challenges. And people of Professor Tara went back to leasing to see how much that can get precise with the learning learned from DBS electrodes and its positions. This is what happened. And we also realized that DBS is not required in every movement disorders patient, especially people with one sided disease, focal hand dystonias, non progressive tremors on one side, cervical dystonia to one side, you know, that's no question about that fact. We all know that there's so many targets in the brain, in the motor thalamus, be the BIM, the ventralis intermediate nucleus of the thalamus for tremors, the BO, the ventralis oralis nucleus, BOA, BOP, BOI, the GPI, which is the global pallidus interna, and which part of the global pallidus interna, which is called the PDP, posterior ventral pallidum, and the subthalamic nucleus. Now we have some new circuits uh, added to this, white matter tracts like the PTT, CTT, all of them added to the mix. So let me show you some of the surgeries uh, I learned from Professor Thaira that I'm doing back in India. A task-specific focal hand dystonia, the BO thalamotomy, a 39-year-old gentleman, IT professional who wanted to play, was learning to play the guitar to become a professional. He developed three finger, you know, cramps, sorry. So you can see here. No paralysis, but the three fingers, the three fingers are that. And then this is him playing the guitar on the operating table. And me leasing the VO of the thalamus. And as I lesion, the fingers got better. You can see him playing much better. I just reduce the volume slightly, guys. I'm sorry about that. It will be a little loud otherwise. Okay. He had a problem in typing with the left fingers. The fingers were curling. Right hand side, you can see the fingers typing being checked online. This is the lesion in the thalamus, in the VO of the thalamus, nine centimeters inside the brain through a 14 millimeter burr hole. For the young neurosurgeons, you can see this is what a stereotaxy is all about. You can get a target deep inside the brain because of the technology that we have in a circuit that you cannot see. That's why a patient has to be fully awake and get the feedback with you at the end of the day. This is him playing his performance. So that's him. This is him. Six months after surgery, you can see the control that he has. He's got it back. So this is a Bangladeshi guitarist. He came to me after seeing this story. He was a professional guitarist, but you see how clumsy his hands are. All five fingers of the hand is hardly able to move. You know, it's so clumsy. He's able to do the C with the right hand, not able to do the C movement in the left hand, which is very important for the people playing guitar. He could text with his right hand. He could not text with his left hand. You know, you see that the moment he holds the mobile in left hand, the hand goes into a dystonic posturing, the thumb is into a posture. He couldn't flip coin with his left hand. You see how clumsy it is. Dysfunctional, no paralysis, MRI normal, CT scan normal, and he's able to do this with his left hand. So checking all circuits on table, all functions on table. So checking all of this. And then uh, the, this is the lesion in the brain. This is the surgery plan, the data that we put in. Then you see what's going on. We do a pre, you know, stereotactic MRI pre and post to make sure that all three tracks are bang on target. Very important to check every single time to make sure that we are on target because that's the learning that we get all the time. And that's what it is. The two guitarists playing the juggle bandhi. I'm going to skip for lack of time. So looking at this, what happened? He, he, he did... He was an avid mountaineer 
And uh, three months after the surgery, he climbed a 7,000 meter mountain in the Himalayas, which means that, you know, it is absolutely fine, this lesioning surgeries. It really does not cause any other disability for patients, even high performing individuals. This is him nine months after surgery. You can see how quickly his hand is improved. You can see how well his fingers are moving. So we go to writer's cramp, another focal hand dystonia. This is a 26 year old guy. You see the way he's holding the fingers as he starts writing, the, the thumbnail disappears. He looks so strained holding the finger, you know, the pen with his hand, very stressful. You can see this uh, writing, left hand side is writing, original handwriting two years before the writer's cramp. The middle was one month before surgery. The right hand side was on the day of surgery. He could only write half a page. And then his hand just stops. He's not able to progress any further. This is him writing two months after surgery with the ballpoint pen, with the gel pen on plain paper. This is him writing. You can see much more comfortable. The discomfort in the hand is gone. This is again a VO thalamotomy. So this, these are lesioning surgeries that we are doing. Then we go to our next target, which is tremors, distal tremors, VIM thalamotomy. This boy had a head injury when he was, uh, uh, you know, nine years old. For 17 years, he had this movement disorder, Sebia Holmes tremor. Extremely severe. That's how severe it was. This is him on the day of surgery. This is him two days after surgery. He still has bilateral, I mean, he has cerebellar signs also. So those things don't get better. But the tremor has come down. He's able to pour water into the cup. He's able to take it to his mouth. And he's quite happy with that. Seven days post-op, he's able to pick things up. He starts learning to write, uh, wear his shoe with both hands. So th these are all functional outcomes that we are looking at. This is him one month after, you know, surgery that, you know, he's trying to drink with it. He still has some tremor at certain positions, but he's able to drive his two-wheeler. He's able to drive his car. He's quite happy with the process. Let's go to surgeries for Parkinson's disease. This is a lady with a tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. Seven years, she had this tremor, one side of the body. Does not qualify for DBS. She does not have money for DBS. It was not responding to Sindopa. This is how severe it was. So you can watch it as I'm lesioning the brain. You can see the tremor in the hand. The lesioning is going on. Boom. It stopped. It's as dramatic as that time. The thalamotomy is as dramatic as this, and this is how it stopped on the table. This is her two weeks after surgery. No, no deficits, no tremor. She is fine. And this is her. This is the VO. Every part of the brain has its somatotopy. It's amazing how it has been created. And we have to make sure that depending which part of the body is uh, you know, having the tremor, we have to make sure we capture all of that in our lesioning circuits. We go to light pallidotomy for Parkinson's disease. When you have both tremor, and rigidity, drug induced dyskinesia, then GPI is the target and not <clears throat> VIM. So this guy had, you know, an on off phenomena, motor fluctuations. He's on stage was only one hour before he could get into you know, syndopa induced dyskinesia. So he opted for surgery. So this is him. Sorry. This is him. He couldn't walk backwards before surgery. He's undergoing rehab now after the surgery. And then this is him. He wanted to read a newspaper without his hand shaking as a retired man. That was one of his requests. So that's him. This is him one year after surgery. He's doing very well. His motor fluctuations are gone. He's independent. His family is very happy. And he's also very happy. It's been five years now since we have operated him. He's still doing well. Cervical dystonia. This uh, person is having this for the last seven, eight years. He had this you know, lateral collars, very severe. And this is him. So it's four months into the surgery. This is what happened. This is the lesion in the brain. As you see, I have got both the stereotactic post MRI and the non stereotactic images. You can see two, uh, two globes there, right, right there, very clearly seen. Two tracks, what I learned from Professor Tara to do, you know, the central tract and posterior tract, you know, to look at the accuracy of it, bang on in the GPI. And in the case of cervical dystonia, severe. Post op, he got 50 60 percent better. I offered him the opposite side, but he was not keen. He said, I'm happy with the 50 60 percent result that he had. That same before, without the pacitin and after the pacitin, he said, This much is enough. This result is enough for him. So, coming next, hemi, hemi dystonia. She's fine that when she's sitting, the moment she stands up, she starts bending like this, very severe. 
so you see her she is bending down and walking she's others you know mentally fine in pallidotomy the results are not as dramatic and immediate as what you see in thalamotomy it's, it's slow over time slowly got better and this is her two years after surgery she's got a little bit of new dystonia in her right foot that she may be coming back to me for surgery for some strange reason you know that didn't get covered in the surgery that we did but otherwise she's fine so bilateral lesioning surgeries there's a lot of story i mean uh, thing going on about is bilateral lesioning surgery possible is it safe you know can it be done so there's been some risk factors of bilateral uh, gpi or pallidotomy causing dysphagia dysarthria so there's been a lot of things going on so how are the results so let me show you a couple of places where we have done bilateral lesioning so we are doing stage lesioning for bilateral parkinson for bilateral symptoms of parkinson disease one side pallidotomy other side the pallidothalamic tractotomy or the ptt so the first time in india we did a bilateral stage lesioning for pd a classical pd case that you can see it's got all the features of pd left more than right so as you can see here no question about the fact and then this is him 18 months after the he wanted left side to be fixed first right pallidotomy 18 months of the right pallidotomy look at the way his gait has improved left arm tremor is gone is so much more purposeful his gait than walking gait left hand tremor right hand tremor left hand no tremor right hand tremor left hand no tremor pallidotomy also reduces tremor significantly and this he came to me for surgery he pushed me for the ptt between the first and second wave of the pandemic and this is him one month after the second side surgery <clears throat> he actually stopped his uh, labodopa for 24 hours just to see what's going on this is what the results are and then this is him gone back to his job of tailoring he was a tailor you can see how much he can regulate the foot pedal also it's not just the hand that is moving even the lower limbs are moving appropriately to make that happen he's now uh, you know this is how he walking this is how he is he's working in a hospital no stress this was published in the romanian Neuro neurosurgery journal recently you know the uh, uh, bilateral uh, lesioning that is done these are updr scores pre and post is all there in the romanian neurosurgery journal so let me show you some neuro modulation with neuro rehabilitation examples simultaneous bilateral pallidotomy for a complex uh, you know movement disorder with axial and apicular dysphonia this man is a failed dbs the left hand side is actually a gpi dbs done in another hospital which did not work you know he was still struggling you can see him he, you know father has to still hold his hand and then make him stand and walk on the left hand side you can see the battery there you know you can see the gpi there on the right hand side you can see him the father is going to release the head right now you can just see him as he leaves the head how severe this is you know it's extremely severe he had no money to replace the battery the battery had gone dead but he, this guy did not have much results of family he was not very keen to replace the battery this is how severe it was apart from the neck and the axis look at his attempt to drink water it's very severe extremely severe he's not able to drink the water in spite of father holding the head he can't leave the bottle with his hand the father has to hold the bottle and only then he can leave then uses the right hand to pick up his left hand so it's so disabling you know it's basic human right stuff so i had to do the frame fixation and the general anesthesia because it was very severe you know there's no way that i can fix it local so gave him general anesthesia but i had to wake him up during surgery to make sure that we get the feedback so this is him awake doing the feedback this is in post op two lesions on both sides one the left gpi made a larger lesion the right gpi made a smaller lesion bang on in the posterior ventral pallidum and that's the lesions that you can see and what's very interesting is if for those of you who do lesioning or who do any gpi targeting usually the vertical below the acpc line is minus 4 or minus 3 to minus 5 in here you can see his right side was minus 1 the left side is actually zero that means when you do visual targeting sometimes you have, you can come up with so much of a change and remember every millimeter in the basal ganglia is like one kilometer so you can't blindly put just the you know standard target that is there in the you know in the navigation system or in this you have to visually look at every image every patient differently and look at what's going on and this is him two days after surgery his head is stable nobody has to hold his head he went to an organized rehabilitation you know for four months as he started at least you can see he got better he went to rehab but head is stable body is reasonably stable you can see him drinking water guy who could not drink water who had to head had to be held he's able to do so much 
So the family is quite happy. He still has bilateral cerebellar signs. There's a cerebellar atrophy that is there, but the family is still very happy. So he's able to manage himself. He has a person who my mother had to be with him all the time. Who manages himself, goes to the bathroom and comes. Still ataxic, but the you know this one is better. He goes to the field and supervises the workers, so they're quite happy with the process. So now let's look at the role of intrathecal baclofen pump in neuromodulation in TBI and SCI. I learned about disorders of consciousness and the you know thing in Tokyo Women. As all of us know, spasi is a bugbear for all neurologists, neurosurgeons, and rehab professionals across the world. So this boy had a severe DAI, three and a half months post DAI. He was you know Glasgow Coma score of 5T by 15. He was emaciated, you know, emaciated. His hands and legs were neck were stuck like this because of severe spasticity. He came to us from another hospital. This is how he was. We did an evaluation under anesthesia, we did a baclofen trial. He got some benefit. The question is, is it severe spasticity? Is there severe uh, in a tightness, contractures, deformity? Is there a combination of both? Myofascial, you know, other ways, uh, you know, uh, is it same across all joints? Is there severe hyperheterotopic ossification? Is it the combination of everything? How do we benefit if oral is not working? So for all of this, what do I do when we, we, we can't explain whether it's a spasticity or my uh, musculoskeletal is? We do the first stages examination and anesthesia. We give a muscle relaxant. And we, the rehabilitation team comes into OT and checks all the joints, all the limb movements, whether they're moving passively across the full range of movements or not, make a note of all of that. And then we do the ITB trial. In the ITB trial, we don't just injection, inject the uh, you know, baclofen into the subarachnoid space. We actually put in a catheter like what we do in the pump. And depending on where do you want the result, we leave the tip of the catheter either D1, D2, if you want upper limb or neck result, or a little lower down, depending on what it is, connected to a syringe infusion pump. And then infuse it like we would do in a pump. And every two hours, the rehabilitation team will look at it. They evaluate the patient, look at what is going on. And then, you know, the catheter space, like I said. And then we have an Excel sheet like this. We enter all these things. We want to know what is going on. And every two hours, the modified Ashford scale is checked. And based on what the score is, we keep titrating the dose of medicine to get the best possible result so that the patient and the family buys and the doctor buys into the fact that this patient has got the best result. Once we do this and we're all convinced that that is there, we implant the pump, which is done in this boy. And like what Professor Taira in Japan, there's some anecdotal evidence to say patients wake up from disorders of consciousness. This boy woke up, you know, within a month of the, uh, you know, uh, the intrathecal baclofen pump implantation. You can see his hand is still postured, left hand side, but some voluntary movement has started from a guy who was completely, you know, GCS 5T, and then he went ahead. He, he now does all these things. He does his own exercise. Right side is still stuck because of some, you know, musculoskeletal issues. This is him celebrating his birthday. This is him able to change, change, uh, you know, channels on the TV remote able to leave the TV remote. Look at the fineness of the movements that has come back for somebody who was posturing. He's able to pick up a chip with his hand, put it to his mouth. His speech is still a little you know, slurred, very difficult to understand. Parents understand, but look at his language. What is amazing is how his cognition is improved. Look at his WhatsApp texting, you know, his capital letters, small letters, sentence construction, the emojis, absolutely appropriate. He can't even imagine yes, that this was a guy Shivam. who took six months to wake up. So it is that how good that is. Uh, Professor Shivam, sorry, uh, due to the uh, the time uh, issue. So uh, can sorry. you can make a su sure. sum uh, summarization I, of uh, your... I will summarize. I will summarize. I'll summarize. Thank you so yeah, much. So, so we, we are, we are yeah, my pleasure. Sorry about it. No, that's okay. I'll show three more slides and I'll close. We have made brain function tests, which is patented across the place. These are our patents. We are holding global patents for this. And this is the end I want to show you. We have two patents and I want to summarize with uh, just a second. Sorry about that. Yeah. Three summary. My take home summary. First one is only technology will not work. The mantra for success is Clinitech. Second take home message is please do not you know try over technology. We can do small, small things, you know, very simple things. Function neuroscience is a very complex process that very few understand. It's CNS is still an old-fashioned wired model. It's not Wi-Fi enabled. It's a marathon race, not a 100-meter one. Consistent, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach is a must, and prognosis and progress is very important. So that's what it is. So this, this is what we have to do. And the last thing I want to say at the end of the day is let us all do it together. It has to be evidence-based with patience and perseverance. And thank you very much for this slide.
So I I want to end with this. Just one. We have a listening workshop for all the Asian young neurosurgeons happening in India next year. So in Bangalore city. So all those who are interested, Professor Tyra is heading this. So those who want to come can please register online and we'll be more than happy to. Sorry that I took a little more time. Thank you very much. Namaste. No problem, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, congratulations. And uh, also, please share the event details uh, with us uh, uh, later on. So uh, shall I invite uh, 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 Professor Lin uh, to uh, firstly come in, and then uh, we will uh, invite our discussion, uh, Professor Ashi, uh, and uh, uh, to to uh, to uh, make some uh, comment. And uh, also, uh, Professor uh, Kasandi, please. Hello. Hello, hello, cousin. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed the presentation from uh, Professor Sharan uh, Srinivasan. Uh, very, very interesting indeed. And uh, excellent results, which we all uh, thank you. saw. And uh, and uh, as he said, the future, I think it's just the beginning now, we're getting results. Yes. And the future should go in uh, a different direction from my point of view, because at present time, what do we do? We make a lesion to restore normality. So uh, that's, that's not, uh, how can I put it? Logically, it's not natural. Why do you have to destroy something to come to normal? Okay, so we need to find out a way of enhancing something so that you come to normality. And this can be, be used with technology, but can be also used with, uh, with some uh, uh, plants or uh, other solutions. Uh, whatever, whatever is used, I think here the field is so wide so that uh, yes. this can be used uh, anywhere and, uh, and everywhere with or without high technology, but we have to push on that uh, direction. Because this uh, right. of causing a lesion to restore normality, it looks like a bit like a nonsense. <laughs> Sorry for that. I admire actually the work you've done and the results you are getting. Congratulations, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Srinivasan Ashish here. Um, I just uh, wanted yes, to congratulate for the presentation which you did. Uh, I think it's amazing. Thank you. And, um, uh, for sure, the you know functional neurosciences are in like uh, coming up in 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 a real sense, and you know uh, the the results were to be seen by everyone. Uh, I just wanted to ask you one thing: How do you select your patients? Because there there are so many TBIs, there are so many patients with diffuse axonal injury. So how do you select your patients uh, to see whether uh, this one is eligible for DBS or this one is not eligible for the DBS? What's your criteria? So, so that patient, actually, I didn't do DBS. I did the intrathecal back and pump. So I'm not yet doing DBS for uh, you know disorders of consciousness as yet. We're not doing that in it. Actually, I'm not doing it personally. So for him, I did not do it for disorders of consciousness. I did it for severe generalized spasticity, which was not responding to, you know, uh, Oral, oral brachyphen and it was actually coming in the way of therapy. That's when when I start seeing that the you know the spastic is so severe that it's coming in the way of you know therapy and recovery, then we give a trial earlier than later of giving an intrathecal brachyphen because it is reversible. Or, or if it is focal, then we give Botox. So based on how that uh, result happens on the trial, then we decide whether we should go ahead with that. One of the biggest risks with trial is if you give a stat dose of 100 micrograms, which what most people do, or 50, 50, 53 times, you know, it may not be enough for us to produce a result when it's severely spastic, which is why I put in a catheter and transfuse to see whether that will help and mimic that. So in with that way, I think our selection, I know one is failed oral treatment for any reason. And if it is focal, obviously Botox is the first. If it's generalized, then we give a trial with the catheter. And if the catheter trial is positive, then we go ahead and implant the pump. Thank you. And uh, uh, I mean, on similar lines, probably we can use it for, uh, have you ever used it for spinal cord injuries, uh, patients with spinal yes. cord injuries? 
Actually, I was to show it because I ran short of time. I did not show you those videos, so I skipped a lot of those videos there. Yes, recently I put a patient from Yemen who had a you know a bomb blast injury, and he had a combined injury to the head and the spinal cord, and both lower limbs. We just touch his hand, and whole hand would shiver like this. And I implanted a pump about three, four weeks ago. You would not believe it. The moment he reversed from anesthesia, the the, the spontaneous clonus was gone. And today, a person who was not moving his lower limbs for seven years is now walking with a walker. So mm -hmm. definitely, you know, case selection is very important. Uh, the importance is to where to leave the tip of the catheter. That's very important for even the upper limb to get. You, you can even release the neck tightness that is there. So then you have to go in a little higher up. The entry point has to be a little higher up, maybe D12, L1 rather than L2, L3 that we normally do. So that we can leave the tip higher up. So that we have, as a surgeon, we have to decide where the tip should land. And one of the important things when you leave the tube higher up is, you know, diaphragmatic paralysis, the weakness and respiratory issue. So what do I do is I keep the head end up for 40 degrees, 24 hours for the first one week or 10 days so that we don't have any of those challenges. And once after a week or 10 days, normally it doesn't bother them. And uh, lastly, uh, with the financial aspects, uh, especially like uh, for, uh, you know, uh, LMIC con con uh, countries, is do you think it's like maintain like you can you are able to maintain it for a long run uh, because they have to be refilled and uh, maintained for a long time so this we do speak to the family about that about the challenges of that and the refill and only when they buy into the process and then i do it so but mm -hmm. the reality is those who sort of i mean and it's like a renal transplant at the end of the day i give them the classical example of a renal transplant the cost of not doing versus the cost of doing i think you know it's not incomparable but more importantly than the cost of doing is the guarantee of a result. And that's where doing a good trial actually is more important than good implantation. If you do the trial, the trial goes on for five days. The family buys into the process. We buy into the process. We see a consistent result. And then the buy-in becomes that much easier. And the family then debates that. Some of them wait for three weeks and try it again. And then in some place I've done trial twice just to get the family convinced about it. And then they buy into the process. No hurry, Thank no convincing, you know, yet yeah. the results have to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Welcome, much, Professor Lane? Yeah, yeah. Any yeah. okay. yeah. uh, uh, yeah, The development of functional neurosurgery has brought uh, no perspective to the neurosurgeons, and uh, there is a great uh, potential in the in this direction, especially with the development of cutting edge technologies such as brain computer interfaces, which can be said to be a significant leap forward. Yeah, uh, I think we can do a lot of for functional neurosurgery. <laughs> okay. Okay, if uh, is there any questions from the floor? So uh, if not, uh, shall I uh, invite uh, Professor Lane, uh, please introduce our second speakers. Yeah, uh, the next speaker is a young neurosurgeon, Dr. Zaida Ajubuni. He is an assistant professor from the Department of Neurosurgery, Jessing Commonwealth School of Medicine from the United States. He will show us some interesting cerebral vascular cases. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Let me share my screen. Are you guys able to see the uh, slides? Yes. Uh, Okay, so uh, this is a case of uh, spontaneous vertebral artery dissection of the brainstem ischemia. It's still loading. Sorry, it's yeah, the, the Google slide is still loading. Okay, well. What about now? Yes.
Yes, uh, we can see it now. Please. Okay. You see the, uh, the slide with the title, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, so this case is a spontaneous vertebral artery dissection of brainstem ischemia and uh, has also like a, shows the concept of floor reversal effect on aneurysms. I have no disclosures. So clinical presentation, it's a 64 year old uh, female who presented with sudden onset right-sided face uh, or facial and hemibody weakness and numbness. Uh, she had a stroke workup. Uh, CTA showed right vertebral artery uh, dissection at the V3, V4 junction, uh, which is, was a grade four, means complete occlusion. Uh, patient uh, initially was evaluated by the stroke team and received a TNK, which is a thrombolytic, and her symptoms resolved. Uh, but then 30 minutes later, she had another episode of right hemibody weakness and numbness. And at this point, they consulted uh, us and uh, I took the patient uh, emergently to the uh, angio suite and performed diagnostic angiogram. Uh, so the right, <clears throat> on the left side of the uh, slide, you see the um, cervical run of the vertebral artery on the right side, and you don't see a flow past the uh, kind of V3, uh, end of the V3 junction. And uh, on the right side of the slide, you see a AP view of the left vertebral artery injection, which shows uh, the basilar artery, PCAs, SCAs, and you can see that there's a reflux into the right vertebral artery and there's an, a pica aneurysm here. So uh, while completing the angiogram at the end, uh, I rechecked the right vertebral artery and now you see that it has recanalized partially and there is no extravasation at this point. And at this point, decided to just occlude the vessel with coils. So I just coiled uh, the, uh, the segment distal to proximal and uh, no more extravasation. Uh, also patient was put on aspirin 81 and her symptoms uh, post optimally improved with residual facial numbness at discharge. At uh, three months follow-up, patient's symptoms completely resolved. Angiogram showed persistent occlusion of the right vertebral artery. And interestingly, the pike aneurysm on the right side disappeared. And mo that's most likely due to floor reversal phenomena. And if you can see here, on the right side of the slide, there was the aneurysm at the uh, pike takeoff. And then you see at the uh, neuron on the left side, it, it's gone. And this is the 3D. You see the aneurysm used to be here, now it disappeared. And just to touch briefly on the uh, grading of the vertebral artery dissection. So this is a biffle grading. Uh, grade one, there's just a regular uh, irregularity of the vessel wall with no. Um, flow uh, limitation that would be in grade two, there is either intraluminal thrombus or there's a dissection flap with more than 25% stenosis. Grade three is a pseudoaneurysm. Uh, grade four, complete occlusion. And grade five, vessel transection. And uh, as for the management of uh, acute ischemic stroke or TIA due to vertebral artery dissection, for TIAs, uh, the treatment, the initial treatment is antiplatelet therapy, three months uh, and three months imaging follow-up, CTA would be sufficient. But if the patient continues to uh, experience TIAs, then endovascular repair of the dissection is recommended. And that depends on the type of the dissection. For uh, grade two and grade three, usually stenting would be sufficient. For uh, grade four, uh, because sometimes a grade four can recanalize and result in embolic phenomena, thromboembolic phenomena, and that the indicate the treatment for that will be complete occlusion of the vessel. As for uh, acute ischemic stroke, so uh, there is a little bit of controversy about using thrombolysis because some might argue that you uh, can convert a uh, dissection into hemorrhage, but uh, the current trends is. Uh, uh, intravenous thrombolysis is recommended. Uh, 
And as we know, if there is a large vessel occlusion, mechanical thrombectomy is an indication as indicated as well. Uh, and as for the dissection itself, then it depends on the grade. Uh, angioplasty is stenting for grade two and three, uh, grade five, four and five, usually just coil embolization of the vessel or using uh, like MVV plugs. And addition antiplatelets uh, after 24 hours of uh, uh, the administration of the intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, as for outcomes, uh, neurological outcomes for um, acute ischemic stroke, um, about uh, about eighty per uh, eight percent uh, will have MRS more than two, which like uh, severe moderate to severe disability, uh, which is way less in comparison to the ICA dissection, uh, which is 23%, they will have moderate and severe disability at three months. And as for recurrence of dissection, the data is all over the place. And uh, I did not put numbers because it's very inconsistent and, and quite variable. Uh, and that'd be it. Now, if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Professor uh, Lane, please uh, can you come in and introduce our discussion uh, to give uh, comments as well. Professor Lane, please. Yeah, uh, I don't have any uh, experience for the uh, uh, say, uh, like these cases. Actually, you want to come in, you do uh, in the vascular cases? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, a great case, uh, Dr. Zaid. I just wanted to ask one thing. Uh, what do you think was the reason for interop extravasation of the contrast when you were doing the angio again on the right side of the vertical artery? So usually like uh, uh, when a dissection happens as a um, physiological response, there will be a vasospasm. So I think there will be a combination of vasospasm, maybe a clot forming, it was occluded. And then over time with the patient receiving PNK, the clot just result, uh, kind of, uh, was degraded and then the uh, dissection showed up again. And then there was extravasation because the, uh, there is no inst instrumentation of that segment. The injection was done at the origin of the vertebral artery. So it's just a physiologic process of clotting and degradation of the clot. And that's my uh, analysis of the of the situation. Yeah, just for understanding of the young neurosurgeons here, like uh, if you have uh, if you have seen uh, that they are co-dominant vertebral artery, the parent vessel sacrifice becomes a good option for uh, either a dissecting fusiform aneurysm or um, um, you know any active extravasation like you had in the case. Uh, but if this was not a co-dominant option, then you have to preserve that artery. In that situation, what will be your uh, next strategy? Because so, patient uh, is on like, uh, you know, I think uh, T and K. Yeah, so for basically for uh, for grade five, there is uh, no preservation option, which is like a complete uh, transaction. And grade four, uh, for, for grade one, you just put patient on antiplatelet. For grade two, with there's uh, internal flap, with uh, more than 25% also treatment with the uh, antiplatelets, if they're symptomatic, then you just do a uh, stenting. Uh, for uh, grade three, pseudoaneurysm also uh, trial medication first and uh, add stenting uh, as a, a supplementary treatment. Uh, these, uh, the, these grades can be, the vessel can be preserved for grade four and grade five, unfortunately it cannot. If it's necessary, you can sacrifice the vessel and then do a supplement with a bi jump graft bypass from like a V2 or, v or V3 segment to, uh, you can do to a, uh, ICA or PICA using occipital artery uh, that has been done uh, very rarely because it's a very unique situation where you need it, uh, but that would be the uh, salvage option here. Yeah, correct. Because the vessel preservation versus uh, uh, deconstructive approach uh, has been always debated, but I think if you have a co-dominant vertebral artery, obviously you can sacrifice that vessel. Uh, it becomes challenging when you have uh, when this happens in, in the dominant vertebral artery, That's because right. then you have to preserve at all costs, and patient has a bleeding in the brain. So uh, you know, loading them with uh, antiplatelet agents 
uh, is it's not not fun. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that is the that is the thing which I think uh, at least the young surgeons should know. Um, uh, based on uh, you know, you have to understand the, uh, the 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 flow dynamics, whether the vertebral arteries are predominant or not, and based on that, I think you can take appropriate decision. Right. And any um, any situation where you have seen that. Uh, uh, you know, I know you said about the bypass surgery in case it is, but in, in uh, uh, a clipping comes into the picture in, in case of a more secular aneurysm, secondary dissection, or you never uh, prefer clipping option in dissection cases? Uh, for, uh, for extracranial, I've never seen it or heard of it. For intracranial, yes. Uh, like, uh, like a clip reconstruction with wrapping of the aneurysm, this is an option if, uh, let's say, endovascular options are not possible, either because you cannot give the patient dual antiplatelets uh, surgery. I've done it in residency where we did uh, reconstruction using a clip wrapping approach, and it, it worked. And you wrap it with the... Uh... What kind of materials? Uh, uh, if we, uh, we use cotton, like, you know, the, the patties, the cotton. The patties. So for, yeah, so we just kind of take a few uh, small pieces of it, wrap it, and then put a clip. And yeah. supplement it yeah. with muscles, as like, because that's the other uh, recommendation for any aneurysm. You just put muscle, increase scarring. Great. Thank you. Great case. Thank you. Ben, can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Zaid, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, would have uh, would you have uh, uh, put a covered stand in this situation? And the uh, practice in the U.S. Uh, it's only covered stents used for cervical uh, carotids for carotid blowout. Yeah. Uh, that's the only indication. So I've done like only couple of cases. Uh, I don't know. I'm not aware of any uh, use for vertebral artery. Uh, maybe it's done, but I haven't like seen it or, or uh, heard of it. Uh, but I think the, also now there's a, a great push for using uh, the new pipeline uh, shield technology because you could put the patient on in baby aspirin yeah. and it seems to have worked. I've done a couple of cases for dissections and it uh, works nicely. Yeah. Ashish, sir, your take on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is, uh, covered stents, uh, you will only try to use it where there are no side branches. Here, I yeah. think if it's so proximal to pica, you would like, not like to you know, prefer a covered stent covered usually stand. in these situations, unless it was further down low in the neck. Yeah. But whenever there is a pica involved, you would like to maintain the flow to pica. So that's why most likely in these situations, uh, covered stents do not work well. Same with ICA. Like if you have an ICA intracranial injury, yeah. you still put a flow diverter, not a covered stent. Of course. And covered stents are very, very stiff. So when you go yeah. around those bends in the vertebral artery from V3 to V2, mm -hmm. it's impossible almost to, you know, to yeah. follow the curve. Flow diverters yeah. will follow easily, but yeah. covered stents, that's why they're not very, very, uh, you know, um, common in, oh. in intracranial uh, tortuous anatomy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. you have any comments? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Zaid for this wonderful presentation and a very nice case. Uh, one of the questions I want to ask has been already uh, answered, uh, but I want you to know um, how do you explain the disappearance of the aneurysm? So, we, uh, I mean, it's well known that for a certain, uh, used to be done for giant basilar aneurysms uh, where you do just clip just below the SCAs uh, to create a flow reversal where the flow instead of coming from the basilar toward the aneurysm will be coming from the pica. And if you reduce the flow into the aneurysm, into aneurysmal flow, then you decrease the like wall shear uh, stress and the aneurysm uh, kind of start uh, shrink in size and disappear. So I think that would happen to the vertebral artery. Although there are some papers argue that not all flow reversal works uh, in the favor of increasing the shrink in the aneurysm. Sometimes it actually aggravates it. Uh, I think we just don't have enough understanding of the flow dynamics and how they affect aneurysm development. But in that particular case, I think uh, it was a dominant vertebral artery and it was a straight uh, jet uh, that's causing 
most like causing the aneurysm because if you see it was straight shot from the vertebral artery to the uh, origin of the aneurysm. And when the flow is stopped by including the vessel, the aneurysm just broke, uh, kind of shrunk in size and severe. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, is there any questions from the poll? Uh, if not, may I uh, invite our chair, uh, Professor Lin? Professor Lin, please yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, pose it with uh, the next uh, speaker, please. Yeah, okay. The next uh, expert speaker is Professor King Matsushima. Uh, he is an assistant professor from the Department of Neurosurgery, Tokyo Medical University, Japan. The topic is anatomical consideration for natural sigmoid approach and its advanced methods. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for a kind introduction. Uh, let me share my slide. Is it? Yes. yes uh, we can see. OK, good. Um, thank you, Professor Lam, Professor Kato, Professor Ben, and Raja, and all those working hard to organize this incredible webinar for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'd like to share what I learned about the Retro Sigma approach from these great mentors. The Retro Sigma approach is the workhorse for us as a standard approach for lesions in the cerebral pontine angle, but it's been only about 100 years from the first description of the successful surgery. Before the basic retro sigma approach, we routinely check dominancy of the sinus and the connection of the sinus confluence, anatomical relationship of this Austrian and transverse sigma junction, depths of the sigma sulcus, and the anatomy of the mustard emissary vein and the posterior conjugate emissary vein. This is a case of hearing preservation surgery for the right vestibular schwannoma. In a park bench position, we prefer L-shaped skin incision and elevated the skin flap together with sternocleid mustard muscles. Here you can see the splenic captis muscle and the other Suboccipital muscles were moved downward without dividing the occipital artery, and the muscle emissary vein was coagulated. Based, based on the preoperative CT venography, we designed the craniotomy. And to minimize the cerebellar retraction, we routinely exposed posterior one third of the sigma sinus. And the slight bleeding was stopped using the surge cell when it's encountered. Here is the transverse and sigmoid sinuses. And after dual opening, the cerebral spinal fluid was released promptly to relax the cerebellum. We dissected the lower cranial nerves and identified the root exit zone of the fissure nerve and put the ball type stimulating electrode to start continuous facial nerve monitoring. With this monitoring technique, the evoked facial electromyogram is monitored at a frequency of one health throughout the tumor resection. And the surgeon can receive a real-time alert whenever the amplitude is, is changed. Now we open the internal acoustic meters and uh, using electrically activated dissectors, the intrameter tumor was carefully separated from the facial and the cochlear nerves. The tumor was meticulously separated from the tumor using the dissectors, micro scissors, and forceps, while preserving the membrane derived from the vestibular nerves, so called subperineal dissection. Near total resection was achieved while preserving the cochlear and facial nerve, and the dura was closed water tetry, and so the suboccipital muscle was also closed water tetry. During these 100 years, 
many contributors proposed multiple variations to extend this approach. These are these variations with many nomenclature may confuse young neurosurgeons, but these variations can be classified into three groups. The first one is extended craniotomy, including the far lateral or transcontinental approaches. The second one is the intradural drillings, including transmeter and superjugular approaches. And the last one is fissure dissections, including a unilateral transcerebellar fissure or telovelar approach. If we apply these classification in the most standard terminal approach, extend, extended craniotomy is like the orbitozygomatic approach. Intergeal drilling is like the anterior clino clinoidectomy, and the fissure dissection is the severe fissure openings. This is the anatomy around the foramen magnum from the intracranial and extracranial side. When you want to extend the craniotomy, such as far lateral, transcondylar, or transcondylar fossa approach, it is important to consider combination of each one of these factors tailored in each case based on detailed anatomical knowledge without being constrained by approach names. This is a case of meningioma located ventral from and magnum. In a park bench position, the suboxter muscle was divided from the midline, and the foramen magnum and C1 were exposed. The posterior conjure vein was coagulated, and the lateral foramen magnum was widely exposed by removal of the conjure fossa and the C1 posterior arch. Following the posterior conjure emissary vein, additional drilling was performed to achieve wide surgical field to around the ventral front medulla. After the dual opening, the cerebral fissure was slightly opened to help cerebral retractions, and the ball type electrode was placed to start the vagus nerve continuous monitoring. Through the space between the lower cranial nerves, the tumor was carefully separated from the medulla and bilateral vertebral arteries. And now total resection was achieved. This is the final view, and here is the postal MRI. High hemiparesis disappeared after the surgery. For hypogrossal schwannoma extending to the intra and extracranially through the hypoglossal canal, we routinely select the transcondial approach with high cervical exposure. In a supraenolateral position, the greater auricular and lesser occipital nerves were harvested just in case for nerve reconstruction. And after the suboxtal craniotomy, we performed the high cervical exposure to identify the extracranial tumor and the occipital condyle. The conjugal drilling exposed the intrahypogrossal tumor and jugular foramen was also opened from the posterior side in this case. In the cerebral pontine angle after drill opening, the intracranial tumor was resected while separating from the surrounding cranial nerves and this is the tumor inside the hypogrossal canal. An extracranial tumor was also resected. <coughs> and uh, after complete tumor removal, you can find the dural deficit in the hypogrossal canal. So we patched the dual gen and used the bone cement for bo bony deficit and the STM flap for covering the dual closure. This is a case of triple dumbbell shaped jugular from in Shonoma with intraclinal, intrajugular, and extracranial extensions, which occluded the sigmoid sinus. As like the previous case in the supraenolateral position, we made the STM flap for dual closure and small suboxtal craniotomy. The sigmoid sinus was skeletonized 
Jaguar foramen was opened and the sigmoid sinus was ligated. After the high cervical exposure, you can see the internal jugular vein, and here is the accessory nerve and the extracranial tumor. In the cerebral pontine angle, we resected the intracranial tumor, and now we are opening the jugular, front, jugular bulb and also resected the extracranial tumor. Here is the post-op MRI without any residual tumor. The intradural drilling is one of the other techniques to extend the surgical field in the retrosigmoid approach. Since the drilling target is the temporal one in which vital structures such as the semicircular canals and the carotid artery are included, you have to know the detailed anatomy to preserve them during drilling. This is the posterior surface of the temporal bone facing the cerebral pontine angle. You can see the trigeminal notch, internal acoustic meatus, jugular foramen, and a hypogrossal canal. Fifth, seven and eighth, lower, and hypogrossal nerves run into each foramen. The inferior petrosal sinus and sigmoid sinus drain into the jugular bulb in the jugular foramen. And the petrous carotid artery is treated anterior, and the posterior semicircular canal is treated posterior lateral to the internal acoustic meatus. Through the supramietal approach, the drilling of the supramietal tubercle you can reach to the Meckel's cave and the middle fossa. The transmedial approach during the posterior wall of the internal acoustic meatus provides reach inside the acoustic meatus. And through the suprajugular approach, during the upper roof of the jugular foramen, you can access inside the jugular foramen. More drinks through the space between the acoustic meatus and jugular foramen can expose the medial surface of the carotid artery and open the Meckel's cave from the inferior side. So you can see the caudal surface of the fifth nerve here. This is a jaguar foramen schwannoma extending into the upper jaguar foramen. After the suboxular craniotomy, we identify and dissected the lower cranial nerves on the caudal surface of the tumor and studied the one held continuous monitoring by direct stimulation. On the cranial side of the tumor, the vestibular cochlear, and here's the facial nerves were carefully separated from the tumor. This is the, again the caudal surface of the tumor and after removal of the cisternal tumor, the temporal dula was dissected and the roof of the jugular foramen was drilled out. The intrajugular tumor was carefully pulled out from the jugular foramen while preserving the lower cranial nerves. This is the final view after complete tumor removal, and he suffered a class deep hearing disturbance before the surgery, but it's improved to class A after surgery as we often experience. This is the intrapetral chondrosal coma with intradural extension. After the rift retrosigmoid approach, we resected the intradural tumor and studied the facial nerve continuous monitoring. The temporal, dual, temporal bone was drilled out intradularly, and now you can see the internal acoustic meatus. And here is the carotid artery. In this case, with hearing loss before the surgery, the common cluster was also opened for complete tumor removal. And on the 3D reconstructed CT angiography, you can see the opening of the carotid canal.
As like the cerium fissure in the supratentorial surgery, fissures are the biggest gateway for neurosurgeons to access deeply situated lesions um, without dividing any neural structures. During the supracerebellar infratentorial or occipital transtentorial approach, opening the cerebral mesencephalic fissure helps to minimize the need for cerebral retractions and reduce the tensions on surrounding vascular structures. When you open the entire fissure and divide the superior medullary villum, you can access the upper force ventricle. In the cerebral pontine angle, opening the cerebral pontine fissure enables to pull down or lift up the flocculus to expose the middle cerebral peduncle or the lutex zone of the facial nerve and the pontine medullary sulcus deep to the nerves. The cerebral medullary fissure is the biggest fissure in the infratentorial region, and its opening is widely used as the transcerebellary fissure or telavela approach. This is a case of cerebral pontine angle epidermal cyst presenting hearing disturbance. After the suboxtral craniotomy in the park bench position, the petrosal and the cerebral pontine fissure was opened to help cerebral retraction. We carefully dissected the tumor from surrounding cranial nerves and vessels under neuromonitoring. For long-term tumor control, it is important to achieve maximum removal of, of not only the cyst component, but also its capsule. So this fissure opening enables this meticulous capsule removal from the brainstem under direct visualization. Above the trigeminal nerve, you can see the third nerve, pituitary stroke. And here is the final view. On the post-op MRI, there is no endoregular tumor, and hearing disturbance also improved as like the previous case. For, for such cavalinoma at Pont Medary Junction, Professor Bertanfi, my mentor, has preferred to use the peripheral zone through the pont medullary junction. On the semi-sitting position in the left cerebral pontine angle, the lower and then seven and eight cranial nerves were meticulously dissected and the flocculus was lifted up with colloidal plexus by fissure dissection. The root exit zone of the facial nerve was confirmed by electrical stimulation. And through the space between the 10th and 11th cranial nerves, here you can see the pontomillary sulcus on which the vein of the pontomillary junction coursed. The lesion was located right under the incision and completely removed in piecemeal fashion through a tiny incision to the, on the sulcus. <clears throat> His modified ranking scale improved from four before the surgery to one at the recent follow up. In this presentation, I introduced the basic retrosigmoid approach and various extension techniques. I hope this talk can help many young neurosurgeons in some way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. And uh, uh, Professor Lane? Yeah. Yeah, hello. Uh, please kindly share your comment and also uh, invite our discussion uh, to discuss about uh, Professor Ken's uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, the lecture sigmoid uh, approach can meet the most of surgical requirement for the posterior nerve force, including some surgery that uh, previous uh, required uh, the sigmoid approach. With endoscopic uh, assistance, it can be also be performed through a simple natural sigmoid approach. Uh, because the posterior nerve force is a small cavity, I think uh, the keyhole approach is suitable for, for for the uh, natural sigmoid approach. And uh, we can also use, use uh, genuine and the keyhole approach. 
so that, that that's my uh, comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Professor, Professor Kumar, do you have any question or comments? Oh, I don't have any questions. Excellent uh, presentation, uh, Professor Matushima. I mean, I've seen you have done an extensive work in skull base, uh, and I can see from all uh, the cadaveric dissections and the time spent uh, with uh, Professor Rotten. Uh, any tips for young skull base surgeons? Uh, uh, because you know, uh, for for training, I think the 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 cadaveric lab uh, training options are very very limited these days. So what can they do to, uh, you know, achieve uh, some kind of technical, uh, you know, skills in this area, especially the young ones? Um, I, I have to say the carbaric dissection is the best way for training, but I can understand even for us in Japan, it's very difficult to get the opportunity to, you know, train with cadaveric specimen enough time. So what I can say is but we have now we have a lot of option, a lot of way to learn anatomy. Especially around this posterior fossil, you know, um, we have 3D videos, we have 3D apps, uh, a lot of carvaric textbooks. So, first, we have to be familiar with the anatomy, right? Mm -hmm. After that, we have to, you know, even after the, from, uh, even after getting detailed anatomical knowledge, we have to think, learn about the neuro monitoring. We have to learn about the endoscopic technique. We have to learn about the microsurgical technique. We, you know, we have a lot of things to learn about, but first one is the anatomy, right? Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, I uh, that's, that's the uh, bottom line. Um, just one more question in terms of retrosigmoid approaches, uh, because here in Toronto, we now, I rarely see a retrosigmoid for a vestibular schwannoma. They have uh, been doing for almost 10, 15 years trans lab approach. Uh, mm -hmm. So what's your opinion on, uh, I mean, I know the retrosigmoid is the workhorse for uh, posterior fossa tumors, but uh, any, any preference uh, uh, versus for trans lab versus uh, especially when the hearing is affected on that side versus retrosigmoid, or you still choose retrosigmoid in uh, most of the cases? Um, for the version case of vestibular schwannoma, we routinely start, select the retrosigmoid approach. We never do the translab. One of the reasons for us is we prefer to use the one health continuous neuromonitoring and we can start that neuromonitoring after identifying the root zone of the facial nerve and put the ball type electrode on the facial nerve, right? And the retrosigmoid approach has a a big advantage to identify the root exit zone of the facial nerve over the translob approach. In the translob, it's a, a little bit difficult and it's, you know, you have to reject some part of the tumor before identifying the root exit zone of the facial nerve. That's why we prefer to use the retrosig. Yeah, and I, I, I saw that you have used the, uh, um the the dissector with the with the uh, monitoring itself that's that's very yeah. innovative uh, because uh, then you don't need any other extra stimulate uh, stimulating electrode mm -hmm. and you can do it on the way go this this is available everywhere or this is like uh, something which you have custom made uh, it's kind of handmade one so and <laughs> we have to we have to talk with some you know the yeah, we have we have to talk about it with some companies. Okay, all right. It's a mm -hmm. great discussion. Let me try about that. <laughs> Thank you. 
the Professor Kalangu. Thank you very Professor. much for thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give my comment. Uh, congratulations, Professor Ken uh, Matsushima. Uh, um, very elegant and very good uh, presentation. And, thank you. Uh, uh, impressed by the meticulous dissection. That's very mm -hmm. important also. I think uh, uh, we should emphasize that to young neurosurgeons that uh, it's an area where uh, the technique of being meticulous is already uh, good for um, and very important for to achieve the, the results. Okay. And uh, uh, I didn't have really any question, but I'm coming back to comment about um, which route, what approach to use. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to know that if you are expert in one particular approach, as soon as you can achieve the goal, that's the most important. I prefer also the plastic sigmoid, I mean, approach, um, but other people have prefer I mean, another approach. I don't think there is a better approach or bad approach. As soon as you can achieve the results and the patient is actually cured, I think that's the most important thing. The second thing I wanted to talk about is uh, um, uh, the availability of cadavers to do uh, some work in laboratory. It's not always easy in uh, many countries. But I heard about this anatomy simulation where they have, they have so, some software where uh, you can use and do uh, some work like in the simulation uh, thing. I understand it's very, very performant. I haven't used it, but maybe it's something which should be, which should be encouraged for young people to use so that they can be um, you know, sort of fluent in the anatomy of that region you know, in order to get, I mean, uh, best results. Those will make my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for wonderful, wonderful comment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the last uh, expert speaker is uh, Professor Takashi Sugawala. Uh, he is a professor for the Department of. Yeah? Uh, Dr. Kundan, uh, maybe Ben, uh, raise a hand. Oh, sorry, um, Ben. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, I, I, short, I, short question, uh, please. Yeah, yeah, I have a short, uh, okay. uh, short, short question and comments. So, uh, congratulations, Professor Ken. And, uh, just uh, to supplement, uh, besides uh, endoscope, using exoscope can also give uh, an excellent view and also uh, quite economic uh, to the neurosurgeons and uh, for uh, with the tilting of the endoscope, especially uh, when you want to tilt, for example, uh, release the CSF in the foam, uh, it also provides uh, good views. And also, I, I really appreciate that uh, your anatomical dissection is uh, very, uh, very uh, good. So I want to um, uh, echo with uh, uh, Kuma's uh, opinions about the, the chance step and also uh, a message to a, uh, some young neurosurgeon. Firstly, uh, it's about the hearing status of the patients. So um, if you want to preserve hearing, then you might uh, consider, if you want to approach it uh, via uh, the more direct attack to the IM, then you might consider Con if you are not considering uh, retro sigmoid, you might consider retro lab approach, and um, uh, which, which need to study the uh, the imaging PO for the corridor, as it might uh, lead to a, a very uh, small corridor uh, for the for the tumor excision. But uh, again, a uh, chance step approach is uh, also a good approach to attack uh, those uh, uh, big uh, uh, big. Uh, vestibular schonoma. And also about the, the status of the, the jugular bulb. In case of a high jugular bulb, then uh, it might be uh, difficult. And uh, so Akuma, is your center using a chance that for all cases or or you 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 uh, reserve those uh, hearing preserving cases and also those high riding uh, jugular cases uh, to retro lab? Yeah, I think uh, we here the skull base surgery team is working with ENT team, so they 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 always work together. Uh, I've never seen neuro like uh, neurosurgeon operating on a vestibular schwannoma on your on his own for for a long time now. They work together and they just uh, go through translab every single time. They're con they're uh, uh, 
you know advantage they think is 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 preservation of facial nerve they say like they'll in in almost all cases they are able to preserve facial nerve even if it's a big tumor so uh, yeah they always prefer cross lab approach here yes and i think I, before, before i came here like we always used retro uh, retro sigmoid so i i think as professor uh, kazadi kolongo said that it's it basically any approach depends on uh, the surgeon itself right both approaches are good for their indications yes i think both of both of them are a beautiful approach thank you so much professor takashi okay I'm can ready? i can i have more comments on the question uh, my comments about the uh, learning surgery uh, the doctor Hamatoshima, I can, as I can say, uh, it is important to learn anatomy. But anatomy is like a normal anatomy and a pathological anatomy. Even if, uh, for the uh, pathology, normal anatomy, uh, even if we have less chance to go to the lab to learn the cadaveric tissue, but we can still go to the abroad or like Dr. Ken did in the army. So it is a little bit uh, easier. But uh, as for the, the pathological anatomy, I think it is uh, just uh, only a chance to learn is uh, to go to the, uh, go to see and go to observe the uh, specialist surgery. I think it is a very important. And uh, one question is, uh, you show the uh, bony reconstruction by the cement or something mm -hmm. around the yes. uh, uh, condyle. Do you mm -hmm. think we need to reconstruct around the uh, condyle bone? Um, in that case, it, it it's sometimes it's sometimes encountered, but it in that case. The the tumor destroyed the hypoglossal canal and 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 it's connected to the jaguar foramen. So after tumor removal, we don't have any, you know, the bony bridge between the hypoglossal canal and the jaguar foramen. So we are not sure we need it or not, but we are afraid of the the long term. This, this function of the OC junction. So we put the bone cement for support of the bony deficit. Yes, so you mean uh, every time you drill the, around the hypothalamus canal, mm -hmm. you, we need to reconstruct? I don't think so, I don't think so. But if, if the, the preoperative osseous damage is very, severe we have to consider about that okay but i think the uh, reconstruction by the cement if if we need to reconstruct to protect that uh, future damage i think we have to <laughs> do fixation yes yeah but a fixation is Sometimes we feel fixation is too much because you know it damaged the post-op QOL of the patient. So, so when we are we worried, when we are afraid of the disability without any treatment, but we, but if we feel the fixation is too much in such situation we put the bone cement okay thank you i'm sorry i'm not sure it's it's the you know correct answer or not okay. i'm sorry so we yes. are waiting for the results <laughs> okay thank you very much okay thank you very much so next we change to the last last speaker professor Takashi Sugawara, please. He topic is how I perform surgery of cavernous sinus. Please. Okay, professor. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 
Yes. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to have this opportunity and uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, all of the committee and especially for the Professor Yoko Kato. And uh, today's my head topic is uh, about the uh, surgery around the uh, cavernous sinus. And this is uh, my partner and I. Uh, I learned uh, scalpel surgery and the priest, and especially about the cavernous sinus surgery. And uh, sorry. And these pictures are from the 2019 uh, Neuroscience Institute opening ceremony. But there are many uh, yesterday from we gathered here. And then they say uh, this year's June, I went to the uh, and I camera sinus course. And uh, this is a third international Rotor Society meeting in Istanbul. This was held uh, last week. And uh, uh, many uh, Rotor's family, Dr. Rotor's family, and the Dr. Uh, Yasajir family gathered and discussed a lot about the microsurgery, especially. Uh, uh, Professor Yasagi uh, mentioned the uh, importance of the micro, micro neurosurgery because you know now the endoscopic surgery and endoscopic surgery were uh, established in the uh, widely spread, but uh, still uh, the micro neurosurgery is very important technique to uh, do the neurosurgery. And uh, uh, from here, I am going to talk about the cavernous sinus surgery. The resection of the tumor around the cavernous sinus involves risk of cardiac nerve injury. And uh, so, the radical, radical resection of such a tumor is still challenging. So, uh, the treatment strategy for the tumor inv invading uh, such a kind of uh, tumor is like we have to preserve cranial nerve function and the uh, internal of the artery. So, resection as much as possible, followed by the observation or radiation therapy. But uh, this resection as much as possible depends on the surgeon's skill and uh, experience. So, for some neurosurgeon, uh, this means uh, no resection. But for another uh, some neurosurgeon, uh, means the gross total resection. Uh, here is a uh, stereotactical tactical radio surgery result for cavernous sinus meningioma. The tumor control rate is uh, around 90% for 10 years. So this is, I think, good enough. But uh, as for symptom improvement, uh, around 30%, only 30% uh, improved. So I think this is not good enough. So um, this is my uh, surgical indication. The surgical resection is indicated for the uh, patients with neurological symptom or tumor rapid growth. So the, the region invading the cavernous sinus is removed as much as possible while preserving the cranial nerves. Now here is uh, anatomy uh, on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. There are some uh, triangles to get into the cavernous sinus safely in the I'd like to mention about this award, Oklahoma K. This was written in the uh, Dr. Rotos and the Dr. Natori's textbooks. And uh, uh, here uh, is a, there's a cave around the uh, Oklahoma Nam, just in front of the uh, entrance to the cavernous sinus. And this is a pathological uh, cadaveric uh, tissues. I think everyone knows about this. So, uh, I'm going to show the uh, anatomy around the uh, trochlear process uh, by the sinolator malignant cases to show the inside of the camera uh, sinus. Uh, here is the trochlear process, and the uh, full snap is running, and uh, here you can see this uh, optic cyst yeah, and removing the uh, trochlear process, and here. You can see the optic strap and the sana and the uh, optic nerve is very close. So we have to uh, take care about uh, these nerves uh, when, it, when we remove the optic strap. And here is the uh, optic 
help you know when uh, here you can see the post now. I think this is uh, one of the five of the FD1. And the C3 here, and this is the zero ring, approximate zero ring here, and this is the zero ring here. And uh, I pre sacrifice the sound now. And here you can see the uh, stamp of the sound now. And you got the, all of the uh, tissues passing through the supreme the tissue. And here's also the malignant tumor. And the peel the temporal zero propria from the cavernous science lateral wall. And uh, here you can see sana. We cut the optic nerve and uh, open the parameter triangle. And you can find the C4. Here. And you cut the V1 and uh, expose the six nerve just behind the V1. And cut the six nerve, and also cut the sun of and then here you can see C three and the fifth pole and the proximal drawing here. And uh, cut the post nerve V one. All of the uh, cranial nerves in the camera sinus was uh, cut in the remove that to more unblock with the light. And this is a cranial facial meningioma case, is, and she, uh, uh, she her symptom was a uh, counting fear and almost complete uh, line of the motor palsy. And uh, I tried to remove and restore the fun that function and open the Bakhtisan triangle, but the tumor was uh, too stiff to remove, so I gave up to remove the tumor in the cavernous sinus in this case, but uh, I had to uh, re remove the tumor to decompress the sana. So I got the uh, tentorium here and I opened the Oklamora cave like this and uh, remove the tumor here. Here. And uh, here is a uh, uh, posterior fossa. And uh, continue to remove and the decompress the startup. This is a final view. And uh, uh, eight, eight weeks later, uh, her, her symptom was completely improved like this. And this case was a small cavernous sinus meningioma case, but she has a progressive glomora and a bilirubin snap palsy. So uh, I tried to remove to restore uh, nerve function. And here you can see the six nerve uh, through the antral to triangle here. And here is the uh, intradural space. So the glomora nerve was uh, compressed to the medially. So open the Okamura cave. Yeah. She had a big Okamura cave here, like this. And they continue to cut the uh, tentorium to expose the tumor. And uh, here you can see the uh, optic cyst and the open optic cyst and the Okamura nub, uh, no, the optic nub here. And uh, remove the tumor with Dura, like this. And open the, the lens triangle. Here is a, a relatively safe place to remove the tumor. Okay. And again, went back to the upper medial triangle and uh, develop the tumor here. And this is the post-operative process. And the there must be running the uh, false nub running. And uh, open the Parkinson triangle. And uh, finally, I found the six nerve here in posterior fossa. So but once I found the six nerve, it, it's going to be easier to remove the tumor with observing the six nerve. And uh, this is a final view. And uh, she had a uh, slight uh, upward moving restriction. And, uh, Apoptosis, but uh, in one week, 
uh, uh, symptom was recovered almost completely. In this case, uh, the recurrent cranial facial atypical meningioma. She underwent the three times surgery and ABRT and the four times gamma night. So still the tumor regrows and uh, compressed the uh, brainstem like this. So I, and also her uh, left visual function was completely lost. So I uh, decided to remove the tumor with uh, uh, sacrifice all of the left visual function and the, in the uh, camera sinus. So here you can see the sauna in the uh, sauna, the moranam here. And here you can see the contralateral sauna. And there are a small papillae of the basilar artery, so we have to preserve these kind of small papillae. And this is a final view. So expose it from C1 to C5, like this. This is a uh, graduation, I think that because of the gamma night. And the brain stem was well decompressed. In this case, it is a uh, recurrent pituitary adenoma cases. And she underwent the uh, endoscopic transphenoidal resection and uh, followed by the gamma night for the residual tumor, but still the tumor recurred. And, uh, uh, invade to the uh, interdural space like this and the compressed uh, optic nerve and the uh, glomerular nerve. So uh, I decided to remove to tumor or transcranially. And uh, here you can see the V2 and V3. And unfortunately, the tumor uh, was still uh, suckable a little bit. Hard, but uh, still suckable. And it removes the uh, anterior process. Here you can see C3 and uh, remove the uh, tumor by section. Yes. And uh, open the paramedia triangle. And uh, also uh, here is the interdural space. And there you can see the tumor here between the optic nerve and the IC and cut the diaphragm and uh, develop the tumor, you know. I think this place was uh, much better to remove from the nasal cavity, but uh, still we can remove the tumor from the uh, transcranial, transcranially. And uh, dissect the tumor from the anterior artery. And uh, here you can see the sun lab and uh, makes a, a window bigger and uh, remove the tumor. Here. Yeah. And the cut the tentorium just beside the femoranum uh, and the, uh, cut the posteriorly along the open border now. Yeah. And uh, the complex uh, sun uh, to restore the function. Uh, here, is, uh, here you can see the C5 pulsation. And uh, here is the posterior fossa, and then we found the six number from this uh, window. And this is a final view. And uh, she had a severe glomerular palsy just after the tumor, uh, just at the tumor resection, like this. It's very severe. But uh, three months later, the uh, symptom almost improved. And she didn't feel hypopia anymore. And this case was a Meckel's cave clear ceremony job cases. Uh, and uh, she had a, uh, he had a, <coughs> the tumor was grows rapidly and uh, she <coughs> had a abduces in the So here's a, a post me and open the <coughs> Michael's cape here. 
can a tumor uh, invade to the uh, fifth nerve? And uh, also, the, we this time uh, we know this tumor was malignant. I mean, the grade two, so I sacrifice the V3. We move the V3 with the tumor. Yeah. And here's a microscope, and I found, we found that I see by the Doppler here. And uh, developed the tumor and uh, found the uh, six nerve and uh, seven and nine nerves. And it cut the posterior petrochemical ligament. <laughs> to observe the medially and uh, follow the six now here and the fourth step here and it develop the tumor but still I didn't find the age of the tumor so I got the blue breathing element and uh, finally found the uh, border of the tumor and removed the tumor <coughs> all of the Tumor with the uh, fifth nerve. And <clears throat> here's a business now. Policy recover improved, recover the 2.5 months later. And here's a summary of the 3D3 surgery, clearly with case of tumor with cavernous invasion. The 60% uh, about 60% uh, was many tumor cases, and sure no more cases, uh, and so on. And uh, I operated 12 cases to improve external ophthalmoplasia, and uh, 80 to 90 percent was uh, recovered. But uh, uh, this uh, one worse in the case was a case of long term persistence of symptoms. I mean, it took a long time. Uh, from the uh, symptom to the surgery. Uh, and this one case was a recurrent case after removed and the carbonized therapy. So the uh, tumor was too firm to decompress the uh, open water. Lab. So, I mean, uh, if the, uh, sorry, the naive case and uh, before the gamma knife, I think we can, uh, restore the cranial nerve function. And uh, as for visual activity, uh, uh, improved at least partially in all cases. And uh, as uh, we discussed about the training, uh, I think, yeah, I know, uh, especially in Japan, it's very hard to reach to the cadaveric tissue, uh, but the uh, so, so I made a, a model like for the anterocnoidectomy and exposure of the lateral cavernous sinus, but also the anteropetral telephonus. I think we don't have time, so just uh, uh, skip like this. We are yeah, comparing the cadaveric tissue and the uh, model. So, so uh, we published the paper in the Hubble Neurosurgery the, about this model. Uh, if uh, anyone are interested in this model, please read this uh, paper. Here's a conclusion. In surgical resection, we have a sinus tumor with the aim to restore the cranial nerve function. Functional recovery was uh, accomplished at a higher rate especially for the femoral and the so With a careful and a sensitive approach, most of these tumor can be well controlled with only acceptable temporary insult. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture and uh, bringing us good insights based on your experience. Uh, any comments or questions from professors? Thank you so much, Professor Sugawara. I think that was, uh, again, uh, in line with extensive uh, and uh, very nicely done skull-based dissections. I, I would like to ask you one thing. If suppose there is a patient who has no symptoms and you see that as an incidental cavernous meningioma, how do you approach that? Radio surgery observation versus surgery with temporary uh, nerve dysfunction, which improves in the long run. Actually, yeah, as I told, uh, you know, 
gamma knife is uh, one option, but the after gamma knife therapy, it makes it much uh, difficult, more difficult to resect. I mean, to improve the uh, function, restore the function. So uh, for me, I uh, observed uh, such a, uh, a tumor with a symptom. So as I, as I showed, uh, my indication for the surgery is uh, uh, tumor with symptom or a rapid growth. And after uh, that the symptom, sometimes symptom occur. Then I try to remove. And uh, after that, it depends on the temperature uh, grade or my uh, feeling after a resection. Uh, sometimes I do the uh, IMRT and sometimes I observe the tumor. Uh, and what's your uh, uh, go-to approach uh, in terms of craniotomy? Is it always like uh, intradural approach, Dolling's approach, or, uh, um, or, or, or uh, you do intradural? Intradural you, you versus the, intradural, yes. You mean that to the cavernous sinus? Yes. I think uh, cavernous sinus was uh, extradural space. So peel the temperature appropriate from the cavernous sinus lateral wall, and mm -hmm. we can get into the uh, cavernous sinus. But uh, as I show the, one of the most important uh, thing is uh, to decompress the uh, open motor lab usually. So, and uh, it is easier to find the open motor lab intradural space. And uh, also, uh, in the first case, I uh, gave up to remove the tumor in the cavernous sinus, but uh, I decompressed the open motor lab around the, in, in the open motor cave. So I think in open motor cave is a very important place. Usually the tumor in the open motor cave is very soft, suckable. So mm -hmm. uh, at least to, I think I, have to remove the tumor in the open motor cave. That means we need to go into the uh, intradural space. Intradural. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Uh, any meant uh, yes? Any chance? Yes, just I want to ask uh, Dr. Quinlan because you are excellent. Yeah. You are excellent keyhole neurosurgeon. You are <laughs> almost a pioneer of the keyhole surgery. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about the, of course, the, those uh, uh, very orthodox uh, skull-based uh, open surgery it will be replacing of the endoscopic, uh, the minimally invasive surgery in future? How do you think about it? Yeah, I think uh, the skull based surgery is uh, most suitable for keyhole approach because the keyhole approach is uh, keep the effective uh, space for we used uh, to do the surgery. And uh, uh, as I said before, we can use general also under the uh, keyhole, uh, keyhole approach. So I think uh, uh, I think uh, the, for most of uh, most of our surgery, we can use the keyhole approach. Mm -hmm. so uh, the, because you can. Yeah. Uh -huh. do, do you think or do you feel the, any uh, limitation of the endoscopic surgery for the moment? Uh, how do you think about? Uh. -uh. Uh, may, may, maybe uh, for some time we can use the uh, endoscope for assistant. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's perhaps so. Uh, uh, we 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 should uh, uh, we should do do something uh, under the normal tissue, uh, and uh, we use the endoscope assistant. We can. Uh, we, 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 we can easier to find the uh, lesion and, and uh, 
uh, and then uh, and then move it without uh, all the normal structure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Asgar Sensei, uh, I ask you, thank you very much, excellent uh, the lecture, as always. So uh, how, how, uh, how do you start the, your, uh, because your, you know the uh, anatomy or skull-based anatomy is very clear, uh, how, how you can start, how, how you study, for, especially for the young doctors? Yeah, actually, uh, for, for me, yes. I, I had, uh, operated many uh, malignancy as I showed uh, some uh, video earlier phase. So uh, actually, I learned a lot from the uh, malignant malignant tumor because we can uh, sacrifice uh, nerves to save their life. And uh, after that, I went to the uh, Dr. Chris to learn the uh, cabinet science surgery. So then I already uh, know a lot about the uh, anatomy around the cabinet sinus. So it is uh, kind of a little bit easier for me to learn uh, cabinet sinus surgery, but uh, it is not usual, I think, special. So, uh, we, I know, I think the, we learn the anatomy by the uh, cadaveric tissue. And uh, as uh, Dr. Matsushima said, I, it is uh, sometimes, especially in Japan, uh, as uh, hard to reach to the cadaveric tissue. So oh, I made the model. <laughs> As I showed. I think the text, textbook is not good enough because mm -hmm. uh, you know, anatomy is uh, three dimension. And uh, also, the, we have to find the feeling of dissection. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you very much. Dr. Ben? Um, yes, uh, Professor Tadashi, I really like your lectures so, uh, so much about the uh, uh, management of the, uh, the how, how to manage the cavernous sinusation. Uh, I want to ask about your experience in those uh, sinolasal tumor. So uh, how do you reconstruct the skull base uh, of these tumors? Because I also have, um, uh, ex uh, have encountered patients that relate to do the orbital and cavernous accentuation together. Alongside the ENT surgeon is doing the um, uh, uh, lateral, um, uh, lateral uh, maxillotomy and also uh, lead to have a ephemeridectomy and also lead to reset a lot of the, uh, the uh, frontal and temporal dewars alongside with the orbit and also the cavernous sinus. So is there uh, any, uh, can, can you share about your experience in reconstructing uh, the skull base to avoid the CSF leaks? So there are many steps for the <laughs> reconstruction. Uh, usually the plastic surgeon do the reconstruction. I mean, the makeup process is bed or some uh, cosmetically. But uh, your question is how to prevent the uh, uh, CSF leakage, right? Yes, so, yes. Uh, usually the signal nether malignancy invade to the uh, interdural space. I think it is maybe a contraindicated to the surgery. So, but sometimes the tumor attach the dura. In that case, I remove the Dura matter with the tumor and uh, uh, reconstruct the dura uh, uh, by the some uh, tissue like pericranium or uh, mm -hmm. and then the cavity of the re resection was reconstructed by the plastic surgery, like with uh, usually the lateral side refrap. Mm. So they uh, mainly use the microvascular feedback for 
uh, we construction. Is this uh, are they using the uh, uh, so they mainly use the microvascular feedback for the reconstruction. Is there any preference oh. in your center about oh, uh, for the what? defect? I mean, yes, yes. Is there any preference in your center? So, uh, what feedback uh, you will use to uh, to reconstruct the skull base usually? For example, usually, yeah. I think lateral side freeze. Okay, so uh, the vatus that are us. Uh, so usually, um, because the skull base is quite uh, destroyed after the operation, so uh, do 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 you know where will they do the anastomosis? Uh, SDA. SDA. So okay. SDA also to the uh, to the. Feedback. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh. Uh, uh, at last, we welcome Professor Kokato to make a closing remark. Thank you very much, Sol, because today we have uh, four excellent lectures, especially the uh, Ken Matsushima and also the Sugawara is uh, a representative of the skull base neurosurgeon in Japan. So we learned a lot from them. I think uh, uh, maybe uh, the uh, comment, the discussions, uh, Ashish Kumar, thank you very much for many, many uh, comments, and uh, uh, which is very important for Wainas. Maybe Kalanga is still with us, uh, I don't know. So, but thank you so much. And I can just say all the best in your future, the career, and also the, uh, um, Samuel, long time no see. Thank you very much for joining today. So, uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, Kazadi, thank you very much <coughs> for your join today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Yoko. Yeah, so your, uh, your, your students you are very well. Thank you for Yes, in, in, a, in two weeks, they, they will be leaving. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Very, very grateful.